What's up guys, it's Brian again from Lake Acres Scuba Marina and we're down here at Blue Grotto in Williamston, Florida and um, we figured, hey, what better place to do our second Q&A session. Now we did a video about a year and a half, almost two years ago on our questions and answers and we compiled a list of questions, up to 10 questions that we get asked over and over and over again and we answered those questions for you guys. Well, we've done the same thing and this is going to be our second Q&A session. What I've done is took all our social media sites, our Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Pinterest, YouTube. Um, we got questions out of our email and even our customers that come in and our student base that comes in, we've got questions from them and we compiled them all together and took the top 10 questions that we got asked. Now what we did was we took some of those questions out that we previously answered in our Q&A session and I'll put a link in the description below to link you over to that uh, previous video so if you want to see any of them questions we'll put them but I got a list of them here that I'm gonna read off and try to answer them to you uh, if you got questions we like doing these Q&A videos for you simply send us in some questions we'll try to get those out to you and hopefully we can do a Q&A part 3 Q&A part 4 so forth and so on so getting started here I got a question here it says uh, do you prefer steel or aluminum tanks and why um, and I, I personally like them both, and, and let me talk about why. You know, aluminum 80s are kind of the mainstay of the whole entire scuba industry. No matter where you go at in the world, you're going to have an aluminum 80 to dive with. Uh, they're going to give you plenty of air. If your sac rate is extremely good, you're going to be able to make an aluminum 80 last at least an hour, say from 40 foot to the surface. So an all-around good tank to use, of course, an aluminum 80. Now, one bad thing about the aluminum 80 is the buoyancy change as you use up the air. So I also like steel. And once again, it depends on what I'm doing. If I'm teaching a class, most of the time I'm going to be in aluminum 80. If I'm on vacation and you know I'm not wearing a dry suit, I'm just a, a three mil one piece or a three mil shorty, of course I'm going to be in aluminum 80. They're, they're great for that. Um, but I also like my steel tanks, you know, like this whole trip down here, I've been in steel 100s and I absolutely love them. I don't have to wear quite as much weight. They don't have that much of a buoyancy change as I'm using up the air in it. So I actually prefer both. Now to go a little bit more in depth, my three favorite tanks to use, steel 50s, steel 72s, and steel 100s. And even though I told you I liked 80s, those three steel tanks, I absolutely love. So going on to question two air integrated or non air integrated computers which do you like better uh, bar none without a doubt air integrated computers guys I've been diving for 28 years and I've seen technology change so much in dive computers and let me tell you they are very very reliable uh, there's not a computer manufacturer out there that I know of that currently has a computer that does not have a battery gauge or some type of battery indicator on it I use two personal dive computers. I use a wrist mount that is non air integrated, and I also use an air integrated console mount computer. Um, I love them both. They both have battery indicators. If the battery dies on my console mount, which is the air integrated, it's user friendly. I pop the plate off, put a new battery in, put the plate back on. It's sealed. It's, it's very easy to use. It's very easy to read and very, very reliable. Uh, my wrist mount computer that I'm currently using, it is not air integrated, but it is also user friendly. It's a rechargeable computer. I do not have to change the battery in it. And it will tell me when it's down to 50%, 40%, 30%. And when it gets below 20, I go ahead and plug it up and charge it. So it's very easy to use. But to answer the question, of course, air integrated bar none, simplest for me, and I, I like it. I trust them. You know, 10, 15 years ago, maybe not so much, but nowadays, guys, technology is so advanced. They're definitely very safe to use, and of course, I'm going to recommend it to you. Uh, number three, we get actually we've been getting this question quite a bit in the last few months. What do you do with a treasure with a treasure hunt find? Uh, and I'm assuming that this question was asked about all the sunglasses and all the things that we find on our treasure hunts. Um, I keep them or I sell them. It's real simple. Uh, this year alone. My wife has been very blessed because I've gave her every pair of female glasses I've found and she's got several thousand dollars worth of sunglasses. So to answer your question, I keep most of the stuff. Um, I have several pairs of Oakleys and Costas or Costas, however you want to say them. Um, anything I don't want, you know, I'm not that big of a Ray-Ban fan, so I sell most of them. Or if there's a pair of Oakleys that I get that I, I just don't like, of course I'm going to sell them. Um, I'll either sell them on my personal eBay channel I'll put them on Craigslist or I'll just sell them to whoever wants them. So, uh, but I either sell it or I keep it. Um, 
Question four, how do you become a public safety diver? And for the ones that do not know, we are very, very big in public safety. I dive on several different teams. I train uh, public safety dive teams all over. Uh, I'll tell you how I got my start and how I would suggest for you to get started in that field. Um, I've been a public servant since 2004. I've served as a deputy sheriff, a police officer, uh, EMT basic for a local EMS department, and I've also been a firefighter for several years. Um, and I, I just combined the two and, and I started, you know, doing call outs for my fire department, for the sheriff's department and everything else. Uh, that's kind of how I got into it. So if you're a volunteer fireman out there and it's something that maybe your department has a team, go get dive certified, get some plenty of training under your belt, get plenty of dives under your belt and then just try out for your team. Uh, if there's a volunteer department somewhere in your area and you're not a fireman, most teams are going to require you to be a fireman or a police officer or something like that. Just go and introduce yourself, talk, you know, talk to them. They may have a, a volunteer um, for civilians out there. You, you just got to get up with those departments and ask them. Uh, number five, does people really dive in the lake? And I assume you're talking about Lake Hickory, which is our lake in North Carolina. Uh, yeah, people dive it all the time. I've been diving it for 28 years. Uh, our lake is not really known for that good of visibility. Uh, the winter time is really the best time to dive our lake as far as the, the clarity goes. You know, we may have 15, 20 foot vis in the winter time. In the summertime, we're lucky to have three or four, maybe five foot on a good day. But the good thing about diving in lake and conditions like that, if you can get comfortable and feel okay or feel safe in those conditions and, and become a better diver, if you will, in those conditions, just think of how much better of a diver you'll be when you get to some place like this. And I apologize for the light. We're, we're, it's night time. We're fixing to go to bed. And uh, I'll try to get you some pictures and videos of this place in the morning. But if you never dove the springs down here in North Florida, come dive them. They're absolutely gorgeous. It's a great place to dive. But once again, if you can dive places like the lake where there's limited visibility and it's, it's not that great to dive, if you will, you'll be that much better diver once you get to a place like this. Uh, number six, uh, we this question comes up all the time by new students or newer customers that come into the store. Why is diving so expensive? Um, I'm not really sure how to answer this for you other than it's relevant to anything else out there, meaning uh, if you're a golfer, you know how much golf clubs cost? Why are golf clubs so expensive? Uh, think of diving equipment, if you will, like motor vehicles. So you can buy a four-wheel drive pickup, you can buy a Lamborghini, or you can buy a moped. All three do the exact same thing. They take you from point A to point B. It's not really the vehicle itself, it's the features of that vehicle that you're paying for. The moped's gonna take you to point A to point B. Maybe you wanna go faster, so you buy the, the Ferrari or the Lamborghini. Maybe you wanna go in snow or dirt or something like that, so you're gonna buy the four-wheel drive pickup. So you're really not buying the vehicle. You're really not buying the dive gear. You are buying the accessories or the benefits of the, what each gear does. Maybe you want metal D-rings versus plastic D-rings. Maybe you want a back inflate versus a jacket style. Maybe you want weight integrated weights versus non -inter So that's where the expense comes in. Now, let's compare it real quick uh, to something that's you know something easy for me to compare it to. In the state of North Carolina right now, current lifetime hunting and fishing license is around $700, $750 for an adult. You know, we are currently charging $350 for the open water course, which gets you a lifetime certification. So you can get lifetime hunting and fishing license for seven, $750. You can get lifetime diving license for $350. All right, here's the biggest difference. The North Carolina lifetime hunting and fishing license is only for the state of North Carolina. Your diver certification is worldwide. So compared to hunting, diving is very, very cheap. So don't really think of diving as, a, as an expensive sport because compared to hunting or compared to buying cars, it's really not that expensive. Um, another thing I think people get scared about is it's an upfront cost to buy all the gear. And, and basically you gotta have all the gear to go diving. You can't just go buy a dive tank or a scuba cylinder and go dive. You gotta have a regulator to go with it. Well, you can't just buy a tank and a regulator, you gotta buy the BC, because the BC is what holds all that stuff together in one unit, if you will, or part of your total dive system. So you got to have all of it. And sometimes that upfront cost people get scared of. Once again, you can shop around. You don't have to have all the features. You don't have to start with a weight integrated BCD. Um, 
you don't have to have metal D-rings. You can get plastic D-ring. Start small. Get Having the experience underwater is more important than having all the cool gadgets and gizmos that come on modern day dive gear. Yes, that stuff makes us safer. It does make us more comfortable, but you don't have to have it just to go underwater, breathe, and see what we get to do. So diving in itself is really not that expensive. Uh, my cameraman's getting eat up with mosquitoes here, so I'm gonna try to rush through these. Number seven, why do you only promote Mares? Uh, if you've never been to our shop, we are a Mares exclusive uh, dealer. Um, this is strictly a business decision flat out. Uh, we are also an SSI store and of course the ones that don't know uh, Mares and SSI are partners now so that that's kind of one of the reasons we do it. Plus we trust Mares. Guys I've worked for several other dive shops in my diving career. Uh, I've sold for pretty much every gear manufacturer out there as a sales rep for or not a sales rep for the manufacturer but as a salesman for those individual stores. I trust every gear on the market. I have a five-year-old little girl who's really getting into water and, and enjoying it, and I've let her breathe off regulators here or there. And, and there's not a gear manufacturer that I would not, not trust with her. I would put any gear manufacturer out there and trust that it would keep my five-year-old safe. With that being said, though, it's strictly a business decision. I do love Mario's equipment. I've been diving it for several years now. Uh, it's very user-friendly, as, especially as a Mario's technician. It's very easy to work on their gear. Um, they're Italian made and let's, let's face it, Italians make some very good stuff. Um, number eight, how did you start in the scuba industry? In 1988, I was six years old. My father was certified, my grandfather was certified, my mom was certified, all my cousins on my dad's side of the family were certified. Uh, my grandparents owned a house at the coast, so I was pretty much born and raised on the water. I was born and raised around scuba, and at six years old, my father used to take me in our neighbor's swimming pool and let me use his equipment. He supervised me, and I absolutely fell in love with it. Back then, uh, to where nowadays you can get certified at 10, back then you had to be 12 years old to get certified. Well, my father would actually let me dive in the pool with him, and at our local lake, which happens to be the lake where my, our, my shop is now, um, he would let me go down to about 10, 15 feet under his tutelage and keep me safe. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not telling you to do that. Dads, please don't do that. Please let an instructor do it. But my dad would let me do that. So I had a, t a ton of dives under my belt before I ever actually took the class. Now, once again, I'm not advocating that. Seek out an instructor and, and let the instructor teach. You don't necessarily let your parent, unless your parent's a or an instructor, of course. But my, my parents would let me do that. I dove with them, and I just fell in love with diving. Well, at a very young age, right after I got certified, I started helping out at the local shop back then that I got certified through. And I, I'd basically help them fill tanks. I'd help out the instructors. I'd tow gear to and from um, the dive sites and stuff like that. And I just worked my way up into the store. Uh, the older I got, I ended up becoming, of course, a dive master and assistant instructor and instructor, and I started teaching. After becoming an instructor, I was also a career police officer back then, and that's kind of how I, I bridged the gap between scuba and public safety. Um, but I started jumping stores, and I taught for several different shops. Uh, I ended up coming back to the shop where I got my start at for a while, and then you know, me and my father decided to go in business together, and we opened up our own dive shop, and of course the rest is history. So that's kind of my background in the scuba industry. Uh, number nine, what bucket list items do you have? Guys, I've been very, very blessed and very, very fortunate to dive all over. Uh, I have some of my absolute favorite sites. Um, I do have four places before, before my time's up and I meet my maker upstairs that I want to dive. One, I want to dive the South Pole. Number two, I want to dive the North Pole. Number three, either South Australia or South Africa. I do, I, I have a passion for sharks. And, I, and for some reason, I want to do an uncaged great white dive. It's just a passion I got. And I know it sounds crazy out there to people who are scared of sharks, but trust me, guys, I'm, I love sharks. I got a shark tattoo over here, so I absolutely love them. I want to do an uncaged great white dive. Of course, I want to do a, a cage dive also, but an uncaged great white dive. And then for the ones that don't know, in Iceland, there's two um, continents where the, the plates of these two continents actually touch. And I want to go dive in Iceland on those. So those would be my, my four bucket list dives uh, bef before my time's up. Let's see, that was number number nine. Number 10, this will be the last one. It's getting kind of dark out here. And like I said, my cameraman's sitting here. He's fidgeting. He's getting eat up with skeeters. So 
Number 10, are there really man-eating catfish in the lake? Guys, I'm 34 years old. For 34 years, I've been hearing a story from old-time fishermen about the man-eating catfish they saw at the, the base of the dam while they were fishing on top of the water. And here's my question. How did they see the man-eating size cat, or catfish on the bottom of the lake when they're on top of the water? I personally do not believe there's that big of a catfish in our lake, Lake Hickory of North Carolina. Uh, are there that size catfish in the world? Absolutely. Uh, if you ever watch the TV show River Monsters, old Jeremy that's on there, he shows you how big fish can get in, in some of these other third world countries. But as far as our lake, which is Lake Hickory and Taylorsville, North Carolina, I personally do not believe that there's a catfish that big in there. You know, we've always heard the Volkswagen size catfish or the man-eating catfish. Although I have seen a man eat a catfish. So, but are there man-eating catfish? Probably not. But largest catfish I've ever seen in our lakes is about 40 pounds. I saw it in 15 foot of water. And we do a lot of spear fishing in our lake. So we see some pretty good size, but I've never seen that Volkswagen size or Volkswagen car size man eating catfish in our lake. So for number 10, no, I do not personally believe there's that big of a catfish in our lake. So yeah, that's an old wise tale if you ask me and, and I'm going to believe that to the day I die. But guys, I really appreciate your, your uh, questions that came in to us. Like I said, this was from all our social media sites, our email from students who come in or our customers that come in. If you have a question, simply put it down in the comments. Guys, we appreciate you. We appreciate all your views. If it wasn't for you guys, we wouldn't be putting these videos out there. So I really appreciate you subscribe. If you hadn't subscribed, if this is your first time being to our channel, hit that subscribe button. Guys, you become part of our family, and, and we make these videos for you. As always, guys, make sure you follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Like us on Facebook. Pin us on Pinterest. Subscribe to us here on YouTube. And as always, guys, we appreciate your business.